Amen. Can I ask you a question, church? Who do you, who do you trust in this life? Who do we trust together? Are there, is there a list of people that you know you can trust beyond a shadow of a doubt? A group of people, a short list, a, a text message thread perhaps, of people that know the innermost details of struggles that you're having, people, people that you can rely upon. Who, <laughs> if you're facing a situation that's beyond your control, something you don't know what to do about, who are you going to call? Me, thanks. So, uh, welcome to the club. I was hoping you'd say, if you were influenced by Harvest Fest yesterday, who are you going to call? Ghost there it is. Spent too much time with the ghosts yesterday. We do, right? We have, we have a list of people. We have uh, certain people that we know to trust in. It's just certain people that we, we've confided in. People that have helped us out. People who have a track record of following up on things. People that we know that in a situation we could call them or text them and we can rely on them for helping us out of a pickle. They, they've been there before. They've solved some issues we all trust someone, something, whether a, a friend or a family member, even some institutions of this world. We trust, especially those of us without pilot's licenses this morning, we trust pilots to fly us places. Pastor Bob, in fact, is in East Watini in Africa right now, and he trusted a lot of pilots, a lot of unknown people to be the experts in getting planes safely into positions. When we go to our doctors, we trust their expertise to help us when we're sick or in need of surgery. When we take kids off to school, we expect that the teachers and administrators and even the resource officers are going to be there to protect and guide them, make sure that they're safe and cared for. But what happens? What happens in this life when we've put some people or systems in places of trust and they let us down. What happens in our lives if, if and when a trusted leader makes a decision that leaves us feeling uneasy or frustrated or fearful? What about when we feel taken advantage of by someone we put trust in? What about the times when someone has earned our trust and then we find out that they've been stretching some truth or all out lying to us, to our faces? Chances are we've all been in a place of putting trust in someone and being burned by putting trust in someone, right? I think it's because of our trusting track records this morning that we tend to live, you've heard me talk about this before, we tend to live somewhat skeptical lives. Skeptical uh, enough to resist all out trusting someone. Skeptical enough to build some filters or some walls, some hedges around us perhaps. We hunker down in some cases. We prepare as we face uncertainties. We prepare for the worst because of our untrusting. When we've been burned enough times by fallible systems and people, we are prone to internalize our struggle, turn inward, and whether we're willing to admit it or not, because of our sinful human nature, our ability to trust in things and people and even God is difficult. Because of this, we'll often find ourselves trusting only in ourselves, saying things like, I, I got this. I, I can handle this situation. Thank you. Thank you for your concern, but I'm okay. I'll take care of it. I'll navigate this. I'll, I'll figure it out. It's all going to be okay. Sometimes, too, we seek to surround ourselves with people who are quick to that kind of an attitude or people who have similar experiences with being burned by trusting in the wrong things, right? People who share our voices and our values. People who share our favorite bumper stickers or yard signs. The slippery slope of having trust issues leads us, I think, to where we find ourselves today. Even today, as the people of God, 
let's admit, we've got trust issues. Perhaps our trust issues are magnified a thousand times or more in a culture where political tensions are at an all-time high. Did you hear the buzzword? Do you know yet that we are as people, we're encouraged and we're coached by a 24-7 news cycle to believe the clickbait that this again is quote the most pivotal moment in American politics and or the history of mankind we're coached and encouraged to believe that quote this election will mark the beginning of something new and good or this election will mark the beginning of the end have you heard it enough are you getting the same mailers and headlines that I am Do you have a burn pile yet? Can I be honest with our church again this morning? You better say yes. I don't want to preach a message like this. In fact, I don't want to preach the series of messages that I believe the Lord has asked me to as the pastor of Hyde Wesleyan Church. I don't want to say the word politics from this table. Partly, I don't want to use that word because I know how many of us are tired of hearing it, tired of constantly talking about it. It has been this cycle, again, of conversation, partly because I'm sick of how so many people constantly talk about it, how it rises to the surface above every other thing in a culture. Again, the truth I think you know this and you see it. The enemy of this world, the enemy of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the enemy of your heart and soul, the devil himself, is seeking and is doing a pretty good job of dividing God's people on issues such as this. The enemy loves nothing more than for God's people to be divided, wrapped up in political talk, doing a little bit of this. Do you know what sign he or she has in their yard? Have you seen that family's bumper stick? Am I the only one who hears this stuff? One of the goals of the enemy is to get us in separate camps, get us mad at each other, get us to point fingers at so-and-so, get us in little and in big ways to disregard the sanctity of every human life he has created. So we're going to talk about it. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping you'll join me through a series. I hope, I hope you'll join me and not church. Join me in a conversation that I am entitling this series, Nonpartisan Faith. The purpose of a series like this should come as no surprise to any of us. The purpose of a series like this is to get us to all be happy. I'm hoping that in this series that I'll say all the right things to please every one of you. Just kidding. It's impossible. Truthfully, I hope that through these weeks together we can align ourselves not with any party or candidate. Not as an exercise in how close I can get us as a local church to keeping or losing our nonprofit status. I hope that nothing in these conversations will get any one of us riled up about 
being on one side or the other of any partisan position or talking point. The primary goal from this pulpit table in these weeks is to encourage us all to focus so much more on the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdoms of this world. More on the city of God than ever getting lost in the things of the city of mankind. I hope you know the heart of this pastor to be that I believe the climax of the gospel of Jesus Christ is wrapped up in Jesus' prayer when he teaches his disciples to pray, your kingdom come, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That the here and now is affected by the work of God's people. And therefore requires us as God's people to engage as future permanent citizens of heaven within our temporary momentary citizenship as foreigners in this temporary Babylon that we find ourselves exiled into. Last week we paused very briefly to look at verses 11 and 12 of 1 Peter chapter 2. Look here with me again this morning at this portion of Peter's letter. Verse 11, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. As we who are temporary residents and foreigners, approach November 5th. I want us to see ourselves as holy discerners. As Christians, we have to be prepared to not live by or make decisions that are swayed by fear, greed, hate, panic. Rather, as the people of God, let us be the ones who are most assured that we have a hope anchored in another place. God's kingdom, his kingdom, his righteousness, his truth, his power, all far greater than any earthly kingdom. We need a starting point, right? If only we had a source of inspiration to help us navigate This mess. That was called sarcasm. Another pastor and author says it better than I ever could. In his book, Preston Sprinkle writes this quote. Listen to this. I think a massive problem in the church today, and your pastor would agree, A massive problem in the church today, especially in the United States, is that Christians hold the Bible in one hand and secular politics in the other. We fail to let the Bible shape our politics. Or, even worse, we form opinions about secular politics, and then we go back to the Bible and use it to rubber stamp our preformed political views. This is to say, here's my interpretation of this. Too often, and I see this in our own lives, too often we're prone to using God's word as an add-on to a position or a belief instead of relying upon it as the sole source of inspiration for our everyday lives as followers of Christ. We know, we talk about it often, that God's word isn't quiet about itself being the source of light and life for us to navigate the complexities of being exiles in a foreign land. I heard another pastor say it beautifully recently about the importance of God's word for us as Christians. Listen to this. Just as we need light to avoid stumbling in a dark room, we need scripture, God's word, to avoid stumbling in a dark world. Amen? 
Just as it makes little sense for us to carry a flashlight but fail to turn it on when we need it, it makes little sense for us to have access to God's holy word but fail to be people of it, fail to read it, use it. Let's say amen and amen. God's word is relevant to our everyday life, our situations, each of our lives. It is to be the lens for us as followers of Christ. It is to be the lens that we see and use to seek to be discerning people as we traverse this wearying and dizzying road that we navigate. So this morning, let's look again at God's word for inspiration about who and how we are to trust. We're going to find some common ground again this morning and uh, probably the most famous disciple. We use him quite often. Common ground in some of how he interacts with Jesus in Luke chapter 5. Go here with me. We'll be looking at the first 11 verses of Luke chapter 5. But we're going to break it up, so keep a finger there. Be ready to pause. You know this story if you've grown up in the church or you've Listen to messages, you've read the New Testament, you possibly know this interaction that takes place as Jesus calls his first disciples. Luke chapter 5, starting with verse 1. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Pause for a second. See how the stage is set. You see it playing out. You see the water here. Jesus preaching here on the shore, initially the shore of the Sea of Galilee or Lake of Gennesaret. Jesus seizes on an opportunity and steps into an empty boat. He's commandeering a boat here, stealing a boat. That's cool. And he asks the Boat's owner, Simon Peter, we're going to come to know him as Peter, to push this boat out onto the water. Probably the acoustics are helpful here for him to push out from shore to be able to continue in this manner to teach the crowd. So Jesus continues to teach, no longer being pressed in on every side, no longer uh, being unable to communicate the gospel truth. The text continues. And here's our connection to Peter and our challenge to trust. Verse 4. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now Simon, go on out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. Pause there, halfway through verse 5. Jesus finished speaking. He tells Simon to push out further into deeper water. He had just completed... His sermon, his message, he's just finished teaching a group of people and it's good and the offering's great. I don't know. People are excited and Jesus finished his job of teaching the gospel, talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's told people this life-altering truth of the kingdom here and now. And we can almost feel the skepticism in Peter's words as he responds to Jesus's invitation. Push out. Let's drop those nets. I hear Peter saying, respectfully, sir, you don't smell like fish. Respectfully, sir, I think you're you're probably addicted to those YouTube channels on fishing and you think you know some stuff, but you don't have the hands of a fisherman. Respectfully, sir, you, you've watched too many infomercials and you, you think you know some stuff. What Peter is saying to the Lord here, what you're asking me to do sounds ridiculous when he says, we worked hard all last night, Lord, and didn't catch a thing. Are you crazy? Jesus doesn't even have to say it, but he's saying, trust me trust you? Again, you don't even smell like fish. You, you don't know the first thing. You don't look like a fisherman. You can't be. All of this probably going on in the hot-headedness of Peter. Does this sound familiar to us? 
Can we relate? Trust you, Lord? Do you realize what will happen if he or she is or isn't elected, in office, being truthful? Peter says, but if you say so, second part of verse 5, if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. I'm standing here this morning in front of you, so thankful that Peter trusted Jesus. I'm so thankful that we have this account of Peter trusting Jesus in a place that doesn't make a lot of sense for a fisherman to trust the teacher. So thankful that we have in front of us the tension that existed some 2,000 years ago that we can relate to today, that the people of God as the church of Christ, we, we can grow from today. Peter trusted. Peter trusted re- re- reluctantly, perhaps, maybe with a squinted gaze upon him. Maybe he's like, if you say so, we'll do it again. Maybe with the, the rolled eyes of a spouse. You ever seen that? Maybe only with a tiny step of faith here. A mustard seed-sized faith. Peter says, if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. This is our first lesson. We need to be a people, a people of God who learn to cry out, Lord, help me, help me to obey even when I don't understand. Help me to obey even when it doesn't make sense. Help me to obey you. Help me to trust you even when I think I know better. Help me to obey you when I think I know what needs to take place in order for everyone to get along, or at least my group. Understand is seen in the faithfulness of Peter to let the nets down again. He follows through. On the actionable invitation from Jesus, if you say so, even if it doesn't make any sense, Peter doesn't understand why the Lord would tell him to do this, but something about this interaction, something about this timing, something about it, he didn't want to, the nets are washed, they're put away, for the, he had a horrible night of fishing, if you've had a horrible day of fishing, or an hour in my case, you know the frustration here again is the real tension for you and me, because we are For the most part, people who take calculated risks in our trust, right? We tend to do some research before we sign on dotted lines if we're smart, especially when there's a high risk-to-reward ratio involved. When there's some work involved and the debate is on and off about what we're going to get for our return on our investment, sometimes uh, it's even harder when someone else's resources are being used or maybe when our reputation is on the line. We calculate the risk to the nth degree. How can we learn to be a people who pray? How can we learn to be a people who obey even when we don't understand completely? Can I remind us again of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? A verse we rely on a lot. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't raise your hand. But how many times do we encourage other people with that verse? It comes easy. Perhaps it's a go-to verse for us when someone else lets us in, someone who's trusting us with the details of their situation, trusting us to uh, find some kind of encouraging, well, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, yeah, you're struggling, oh my goodness, just trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not in your own understanding, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he's going to make your path straight. To trust in the Lord when the going gets tough means for us to Call the time out when we see that verse on our wall, in our house, used as a great Instagram post for someone else. Trust means to have a bold confidence, a security, assuredness, faith, 
To trust in the Lord with all our heart is contrasted by not depending on our own understanding by the wisest man to have ever lived. Trust in the Lord. Do not depend on your own understanding. Do you see the tension here? Do you see the contrast of the fallible versus the infallible? The failable versus the never failing? The sovereign versus our limited perspective? The most powerful versus the very weak? The all-knowing versus being an idiot sometimes? Why is this so hard for us? To put all of our trust in the one who sees us? Why? Because he says to. Those four words, this might do some bad stuff to you because it does for me. You ever heard those words growing up? Because I said so. Eat your vegetables. Why? Why? Because I said so, he said. Clean your room. Why? Why? Because I said so. <laughs> Brush your teeth. Why? Because I said so. There's some PTSD from growing up in a household where I was told to do some good things, necessary things. But as I stand here, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is the ultimate source of security and trust. He is unwaveringly trustworthy, even especially so when I don't understand, even especially so when I can't see beyond the horizon, even especially so when I'm not so sure how things are going to work out. My prayer is going to continue to be, Lord, Help me to say yes. Help me to obey you even when I don't understand. Because I trust you, I'll let down the nets. I'll take this walk of faith. I'll trust that you're in control. What happens in the narrative? There's not enough verses between verses 5 and 6. There's not enough storyline for us between the verses to understand exactly what takes place. But in verse 6, the next verse says, this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear and a shout for help brought their partners in from the other boat and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. Oh my goodness, the catch of a lifetime, right? God knows what he's doing. Jesus knows what he's doing here and let's be honest, his best is better than their attempts. The narrative continues, we've got to keep going. You're hungry for lunch. Luke 5, verse 8, when Simon Peter realized what had happened in this moment, he fell to his knees before Jesus and he said, oh Lord, please leave me, I'm such a sinful man, for he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid, from now on you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. As soon as they got back to shore. Quickly, let's acknowledge the fact that Peter's response to the holiness of God is this sense of shame. This miracle in his midst. Peter falls to his knees and he says, Lord, get away from me. As he falls to his knees. And Jesus' tender response at the onset of shame beautiful and loving. Don't be afraid, he says. It reduces Peter's shame in this moment to dust. In fact, Jesus calls him in his response. Don't be afraid. In fact, I'm going to call you now, Peter. I'm going to call you to be a fisher of people, to a new mission. I'm going to show you a whole new way of doing this thing called fishing, this new opportunity, this new calling for you. I, I have a whole mission for you, Peter. James and John responded and left everything and followed Jesus. The second prayer that we need to cry out to the Lord with is, Lord, help me surrender what I can't control. For Peter and James and John, they dropped their nets. They left 
the normal behind. They stepped away from their own provision, their livelihoods, generations of fishermen in their family, per, perhaps. They're, they're normal, they're everyday, they're, their own security for their families, their livelihoods, their, their planned futures. This is what we're going to do. This is, this is what we do. This is who we are. And at the calling of Christ, they said, there's a better way. Why did they surrender? Because his best is better. A couple weeks ago, I got a text from a dear friend of mine. The text just said, please pray. Pray for my job. I just got an email from the company and they're downsizing and I know what that might mean. And immediately my, my breath whispered prayers to the Lord for strength and peace for this friend. And almost as quickly as I began Praying, I felt impressed to remind this dear friend of the truth that this job, an uncontrollable in this situation, isn't the foundation that they need to rely upon. Rather, the foundation is in the provider, their provider, their Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Similarly, here we are, church, American church, Clearfieldian church, with some Grampians in here, Hi. some Penfields, some Kerwin's Villain, Kerwin's Villains, just kidding. David penned some words of a psalm that won't be making its way into any national anthem stanzas in our lifetime. Psalm 20, verse 7 says this, Some nations, some nations boast in their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. Let's rewrite it for today. Some, some of us trust in the economy. Some of us trust in our 401ks, some trust and build their lives around the ability to provide for their family, some trust in their job, some trust in the person we hope holds office. Some, but we, the special possession of God, we choose to trust in a sovereign God who is in total control. We, as the people of God, choose to trust that one day he will make all things new. We choose to, as the people of God, trust in the one who is going to wipe out all evil, restore all things, bring true and lasting perfect peace. No more crying, no more sickness, no more pain. Some will trust in the institutions of this earthly kingdom. But I, I trust in the name of the Lord my God. Will you stand? Church, I invite you to reflect on the, the trust that we place in God amidst this life's uncertainty. Just as Peter obeys Jesus' call to let down his nets, we can and should learn to surrender our fears and our doubts, our trust issues, anchoring our hope in God's kingdom rather than any shifting sand. Amen? So let's commit to being a people who seek God's wisdom, God's discernment, trusting that his plan is greater than our best idea of what needs to happen. And as we navigate this sinful world, 
Let's remember, true peace and security doesn't come from any outcome or any stability of any earthly institution. But as the people of God, we stand firm on an unwavering faith in the one who holds the future. Let's not just make it talking points. So this week, surrender your trust issues. You have them. We have them. Let's seek ways to deepen our trust in the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's pray for guidance in our decision-making and courage to follow his call even when we don't understand, even when we don't see a rhyme or reason, even when it doesn't make sense. Together, let's focus on being the citizens of heaven, bringing his light into every conversation and situation that we encounter. It's easy to be wrapped up in our human mess. Let's focus on the divine. Bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the time that we've spent in your presence together this morning. We acknowledge you are sovereign and faithful. We confess that at times we place our trust in worldly systems rather than in you ultimately. Forgive us for our doubting. Help us to remember that our security lies in you alone. Father, forgive us of ignoring the sanctity of life of anyone with a different opinion. Lord, I lift those of us up who are struggling to trust you. And I ask for your guidance as we navigate this life and the challenges we face as a community. Lord, would you help us to find true unity in a shared faith and commitment to trusting you? Would your people, Lord, would we as your people learn to release our fears and our uncertainties into your hands? Would you give us the strength to follow you wherever you lead, even when the path is unclear? And Lord, again, more than ease, we pray for holiness. More than simplicity, we pray for holiness, your righteousness, your way. Start right here, right now. In us, we pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Surrender your trust issues. He does not move. <laughs>